Good evening, Erev Tov, and good day to all our friends wherever you are. My name is Ruby Shamir, and I'm the Executive Director of AFL, America Israel Friendship League in Israel. I'm happy to host you on this webinar, Art and the Wow Effect. For the last two years since COVID started, AFL has been hosting webinars on different topics. We already have hosted over 200 webinars. One of my favorite topics is art. We already have visited with you many museums and galleries, both in Israel and in the US. From landmarks in Tel Aviv, like the Gutman Museum and the Rubin Museum to galleries in New York and augmented reality in botanical gardens, both in the US and Israel. Today, I'm happy to introduce to you Debbie Luzia, who will speak about art and the wow effect. I have known Debbie's family since childhood. Actually, she was born into the art world. Her father, who is with us tonight, today, uh, founded the renowned Stern Gallery in Tel Aviv. Debbie is an expert in world of art and the author of the book, Why the Mona Lisa Lost Her Smile. Now, I would like to introduce to you my, the moderator, Wayne, my colleague, Wayne Firestone. Wayne, please, the floor is yours. Ruby, thanks. I could not be more excited uh, to be moderating a panel on a really yucky day, uh, pretty much weather-wise for everybody out there. I know our friends are suffering in the Northeast with some seriously uh, cold weather. And even where I'm at, there are like tornado watches. So uh, we know things are like spinning around and 2022 is starting with lots of uh, challenges for us. And so we set the bar high. We came uh, and met uh, one of your friends, Debbie Luzia, who's like an expert on WOW, who has written a book in Hebrew, so you're gonna have to wait on the English, but you're gonna learn a lot about her insights today about how Mona Lisa might've lost her smile. We're gonna do everything possible to put a smile on everybody's face today. First, let's start with some nostalgia. Put into the, if you're with us live today, put into the chat or on Facebook, let us know what was your last WOW experience? I mean, I could count so many, uh, uh, from, from my Israel experiences. And that's one of the fun thing in this webinar that we've been doing is sort of bringing people back to some of those moments. But if you could uh, just recall, uh, you're gonna hear about how Debbie defines uh, WOW and the future of WOW. But let's hear from a little bit uh, from, from uh, the audience about uh, you know, what your WOW experience, Andres Gursky on the VOV. Kusama at the NYBG. Uh, we've got some great abbreviations going on here. I don't know what all of them mean, but I think people for sure are uh, uh, relating to what experiences that they've had that are still uh, meaningful. Someone said the Ju Jerusalem Botanical Virtual Exhibit, which was one of the uh, webinar episodes that we ran uh, recently, and which was indeed a global phenomenon. Debbie, you are in Israel. Your family made Aliyah, created the, the storied Stern Gallery. You could have had uh, your focus on the Mona Lisa's of the world. But somewhere along the line, you took a path that led you to greater inquiry and sharing about this idea of wow. How did you make that veer in your journey? And where is it? Uh, I know you've got great stuff to show for us today. Um, we're looking forward to seeing what 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 you're going to share about WOW. Um, WOW is just one element. Hi, first of all, hi everyone. It's amazing to see so many people, and I'm proud that my parents are on this call as well. Especially my father, who's going to be 93 next birthday, and uh, he actually introduced me. I mean, I was born, as Ruby said, into the world of art, uh, into the business part of art. Um, owning a gallery and then becoming second generation owner of the gallery. But my heart always went to the more academic um, aspect of art, doing research, curating, uh, writing about it. And um, so in the, in the past few years, 
uh, since our physical gallery has closed and now we only uh, work online, uh, I have had time to pursue my real passion and that is um, talking about art, writing about art and making art accessible to people in a very um, down to earth way because it's a very complex um, subject. So this is my passion today and uh, I like to um, in, I like to examine different phenomenons and and what I'm going to talk to you about is one of the mo most exciting ones of the of this um, this age and, and period we're in. So Debbie, I know you have a lot of material to cover. I just want to let the audience know if you have questions, we're going to try to save most of them for the end and not interrupt Debbie during the presentation. This is probably about three hours of material, if not more condensed into our, our, our little hour webinar. Uh, so we're gonna try to wow you as much as possible. And then at the very end, we'll get to a few of your questions. We, we, we promise. Okay, so shall we begin? As we say in Boca, yalla. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so as I said, um, I'm interested in different phenomena and uh, I have noticed uh, something that maybe other people might be able to relate to. Uh, in the past few years, I noticed that I've been more attracted to experiences rather than to stuff, you know, rather than to buying things. I also noticed that from around the beginning of the 2000s, there's been a growing phenomenon of grandiose art installations and, and art events that require active participation, you know, and uh, as opposed to passive viewing. And if you think about it, even if we go to a hotel, so we're not only looking for a place to put our head down, we, are, we always look for an extraordinary experience. We'd like special design, yoga, um at sunset on the hotel roof maybe some surprise in our room you know personal treatment entertainment and when i did when i started my research i discovered that this phenomenon actually has a name and uh we are now at, in the experience age so we have become experience hunters and wow consumers and if you can relate to that then you can pop a message in the chat um we want to get excited. We want to do something new and unique and disconnect from the world for, for a while, you know, especially with everything that's going on right now. We want to have a good time. So what I'm going to do uh, is tell you about some of my personal wow experiences, but also um, map some other wow experience. And so that we'll see what we can learn from them and how we can think uh, of what makes a wow experience and how, how we can actually uh, enjoy our experience even more. So one of the great wow artists of our time was Christo, who, who sadly passed away last year. Christo Vladimirov Yavachev was born in Bulgaria in 1935. He actually was a one-man artistic movement and was known at the beginning mainly for wrapping things. I was really lucky to stand this close to him in London 2018. I took this photo when I actually went to see um, this uh, installation, which was called the London Mastaba. It consists of 7,506 stacked barrels on a floating platform uh, on a lake in, uh, in Lake Serpentine Lake in, in Hyde Park. So his dreams were large scale and he was actually able to fill most, fulfill most of them. Although many of his um, installations took years to actually manifest. And the essence of his work was a dramatic but temporary intervention in the man-made or natural landscape. I'm sure many of you heard about this last project manifested after his passing, passing just a few months ago, when after 60 years, it took him 60 years to manifest this uh, wrapping of the L'Arc de Triomphe in Paris. He wrapped it with 25,000 square meters of fabric, 
that was attached with 3000 meters of red rope. And like all his works, this too was temporary and on display only for 16 days and it will never be shown again. All his work, you might be interested to know, was self-funded from the sale of preliminary sketches and paintings. I experienced uh, Christo for the first time in 2005 in Central Park, New York, where he erected 7,500 colored gates. Did any one of you get to see that? That was really amazing. And as you can see, on the day I arrived, the sky was blue, there was white snow on the ground, and these orange uh, gates. Even now, when I talk about it, I feel this thrill. And I remember the excitement I felt as I walked through the gates with the orange cloth above me and, and uh, in front and behind. And I, I felt I just couldn't contain this, this beauty. I, I really, I wanted a shout, you know. It was just amazing. And, and I just felt how lucky I was to experience it. So when I read about Christo's new project, uh, that was back in October 2015. I knew there was no way I was going to miss this. Uh, the Floating Piers was an installation that took place in Italy from June 18th to July the 3rd in 2016 in Lago di Seo. Lago di Seo is the first la fourth largest lake in Italy, although it's the least known. Uh, it's about one and a half hours um, northeast of Milan. And... Um, the experience uh, included three days pre-opening of the installation. So we actually had a, a glimpse of the crazy production that was indeed one of uh, the, the most dramatic wow experiences that I had to see how all this came together. So this sleepy lake, uh, Lago di Seo, as you see, has a huge uh, island in the middle of the lake and a tiny little um, island that you can see on the left. Uh, and what you see is the orange floats that um, all, all in all about three kilometers long and they connected for the first time the mainland, uh, a little town called Susano you can see on the right, connected the mainland with the island. Usually you have to go to go by ferry and then connected the island, the big island to the little island called the Beretta Island, which belongs to the Beretta family, the Beretta, the guns. Um, and uh, the whole thing started for me with an amazing surprise. As I was, as we were uh, approaching Milan, I happened to look outside the window. And if you look uh, just to the left of the engine, you will see the shape of the floating piers in white. And that they were white because they hadn't yet been covered. So I just, the plane, El Al did not have any, uh, have any clue that this is where I was going. But the fact that I happened to look out of the window just as the plane was going over Lago di Seo and see this, I thought, well, not, uh, this is an amazing sign. So uh, this was the beginning of my, of my uh, experience. And as we arrived uh, uh, early, so they were just putting down the orange uh, fabric on the ground and on the piers. And this behind the skin experience was really exclusive and an important part of the overall experience. And then it opened on the first day, we actually were, were one of the first people to walk on the water. And it was a very physical and sens sens sensory uh, experience. The floats were very well anchored to the bottom of the lake, but then you could feel them swaying gently with the water. And Christo had said that he wanted this installation to be part of nature. And indeed, you know, the heat of the sun or rain, as it rained later on, wind, water, fluctuations, everything enhanced uh, the experience. And as you see, there were no guards, no railings, and people were walking leisurely in groups, having picnics, laying down and feeling the, the, the movement of the floats. 
And this participation in the physical experience increased the, um, it created kind of an emotional attachment. You, you feel it with all your senses and it becomes uh, an unforgettable experience. After 16 days, Christie's floating piers installation was dismantled, uh, recycled, and it disappeared. And what, rem what remains are thousands of photos and experiential memories of 1.2 million people who came to Lago di Seo and made it the most popular event, art event in 2016. And interestingly, the organizers estimated no more than a half of a million visitors, but they didn't take into account the wow effect. So let's, let's break this down. We don't always know how to analyze our experiences, but there are certain components that characterize a wow experience. So let's look at this experience and break it down. The surprise of seeing the installation from the plane, plane. the exclusivity of being part of a small group that came early to witness the setup, the interaction, being an active experience, not just a passive experience, and the immersiveness of it, the multi-sensorial experience, and of course, the fact that it was a spectacular, large-scale dramatic display. All of these elements will appear in the examples that I will present to you uh, in, my, in my talk. So let's start with big, and let's start with the, with the spectacular uh, element. You know, when people talk about spectacular art, they usually uh, mention it in a negative tone that implies that we're talking about um, impression and not substance. But considering the, the vast co uh, competition for attention, it does take a lot to stand out. So here are some examples of spectacular installations like this one, which was uh, the 2003 weather project of the Danish artist Olafur Eliasson, and this inaugurated the turbine space of the Tate Modern Museum, which opened the year before. And as you know, it was converted from a power plant into one of the world's most renowned exhibition uh, museums. And it's what it is: it's a large cycle of lights that simulate sun and mirrors on the ceiling, and a device that created steam. And all this created this illusion. As, as if it was a hot summer day, as if the visitors were actually experiencing the sun. And as you know, in England, uh, it's, no, it's, it's a big deal to experience the sun in full force, not something British are used to, and certainly not inside a building. So people would actually lay on the floor and stay there for a long time, feeling like they were in nature. And, and the, the installation became a social experience. So this work, um, also contained um, interactivity and immersivity. So, and these are other aspects that I will talk about. Some would say that Jeff Koons is the ultimate expert on spectacular art. He definitely knows how to produce a wow. And this is Koons' Blooming Puppy, which was also uh, featured at Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center, I think two years ago, and is a permanent exhibit at the Bilbao Guggenheim um, and back to Crystal. Just because of the sheer works of his, he definitely uh, is the most spectacular artist in my eyes. And just a few more of his wow creations. This was 1972, he spread a, a curtain across the valley in Colorado that didn't last long because the wind uh, tore it and it became a hazard. In 1985, he wrapped the Pont Neuf Bridge in Paris. And in 1983, he circled these 11 islands in the Biscayne Bay in South Florida. So uh, knowing that there's a small window of time in which one can experience something, the knowledge that I have gained a rare one-time and temporary experience as with the Cristo floating piers, this increases the enjoyment that comes from exclusivity. And by the way, this is the, ration, the rationale be, behind all the, the, the pop-up ventures that we see everywhere, because you know that you have a certain amount of time, and if you miss it, then that's it, it's gone. So exclusivity is a big thing um, in relation to wow experience. And here is another 
uh, exclusive, uh, one of my uh, private privileged exclusive experiences when I was invited to the press exposure of the Leonardo da Vinci retrospective in Paris uh, in October 2019, which by the way was the last time I got on a plane. Uh, and I was excited about seeing the Mona Lisa because I had only seen the Mona Lisa once when I was a child. And um, you know, the, you don't go to the Louvre. Well, if you've been once to the Louvre, then uh, that sort of is it. But um, I had this fantasy to, to go and see the Mona Lisa on the day of the uh, press preview when the museum was closed. But you see, the Mona Lisa was not part of the exhibition. The Mona Lisa stayed where it is. It's not uh, something to be moved. And 20,000 people a day come into the Louvre just to see the Mona Lisa. And I'm sure you've all seen pictures of all the crowds and everything. So um, I had this idea that this would be really my, my uh, opportunity. But then I was told, no, 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 uh, you can't see it because the museum is closed. So I went into the exhibition and I spent a few hours there. And as I'm leaving, I stop next to the PR desk. And I start chatting to the PR uh, person and I told them about my, my dream to see the Mona Lisa. And she said, well, actually there's a small group of people that got permission to go and see the Mona Lisa and you can join them. So I thought, oh, wow, you know, a small group of people. I was thinking like 50 people, 40 people. And then three people come along with a guide. And the next thing I know we're being rushed uh, through the empty museum and uh, up in a lift and past the guard and she said the, the guy said yeah yeah they're with me they're with, with five people and all of a sudden there I am almost alone in front of the Mona Lisa and I just couldn't believe it I just couldn't believe it this excitement I must say came more from the surprise and the exclusivity of it than from the Mona Lisa itself that as you know is tiny Although, I mean, you can't really get close to the Mona Lisa even if you're on your own because there's this barrier and, um, and glass. But um, this was a once, in a, and I said to the guide, I said, I feel like Beyonce, you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z, they uh, filmed a clip uh, in front of the Mona Lisa and in the Louvre, they were alone. And the guide said, oh, no, no, when they were there, there were much more, much more people in the room because they had their, their teams and their... Uh, cameras and everything. So this was one of the uh, rare once in a lifetime intimate encounters that will always stay with me. And did I take a selfie? Well, of course I did. <laughs> so here we are, the Mona Lisa and me. And if you want to know why the Mona Lisa stopped smiling, this is the reason. Because if you ever go to the Louvre and you'll see that people don't really look at the Mona Lisa. What they're more interested to do is to turn their back on the Mona Lisa and take a, a selfie where they are the center of attention and the Mona Lisa is just in the background. So that's why she stopped smiling. So surprise, the other, another element that we saw can definitely produce a wow effect as with the Mona Lisa, and as with the view from the airplane, but also when we see things that we don't expect. And this happened at the Damien Hirst exhibition in Venice 2017, parallel to the Biennale. Um, and he had two large exhibitions that were actually the, the part of one exhibition called The Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable. And if you read the name carefully, you already realize something is a bit fishy about the name. This was based on a story about a shipwreck full of treasures that was discovered in 2008. And divers have for years been involved in extracting the artifacts from the wreck. And the, the, the images in, the, in both exhibitions were um, allegedly the artifacts, artifacts from the wreck of the unbelievable. So unbelievable as it seems, it actually was because then you find yourself standing in front of Goofy or Mickey Mouse and you realize that the whole thing is a fiction 
and they were, and the whole thing actually was um, uh, uh, produced and uh, invented by Damien Hurst, but very effective and very beautifully done uh, and worth a special lecture in itself. And here we reach another element, the interactive element. As I showed at the beginning of the lecture, interaction increases the intensity of the experience. Now, the classical mode of viewing art does not require active participation. You can walk around the museum as a passive viewer in the face of the whole uh, world of art. And the idea of interacting with art was born actually in, in the beginning of the 20th century in art events that once were called happenings, uh, which, began, which began as activist activities in the first half of the 20th century and sort of dwindled in the 1960s, but uh, reinvented themselves um, in what is today very respected, uh, uh, a very respected artistic medium, and that is the performance. So um, today we see more and more interactive works of art in, in which the participant is an active viewer that contributes to the artwork. And that uh, Olafur Eliasson's retrospective exhibition at the Tate Modern in 2019, there was an empty room just with colored spotlights on the floor. And those spotlights created shadows of any anyone who entered the room. In fact, without an audience, there was no art. So people gathered and, and, and uh, played around in groups, lifting their arm, lifting their hands and dancing. And, and that became, they became, uh, uh, part or actually they became the artwork. And this is another example of interactive art, uh, which I uh, encountered in New York, Daniel Rosin. He uh, created a screen that actually translates into the language of painting anything that stands in front of it. So these people, you can see they're standing in front of the screen and you can see them as if they are painted. And this is also, uh, um, an interactive art that changes with uh, the, who, according to whoever stands in front of it. Not all interactions require technology and, and perhaps the most compelling interaction of them all is the human interaction. And this is the expertise of Marina Abramovich who is referred to as the grandmother of performance art. In 2010, she created The Artist is Present at the MoMA in New York and for three months, seven hours a day, she sat on a chair in, at a table and people from the audience sat in the chair in front of her and looked into her eyes for as long as they wanted. Now, the element of time is important here because it allowed people to become immersed into the situation, into Abramovic's magnetic gaze. And it is, I have experienced it myself and allowed one to feel its impact and react. Some cried, some laughed. And there was a particularly moving scene when Olai, who has passed away in the meantime, who was Abramovich's partner, he surprised her and sat down in front of her. The range of emotions that were expressed in that interaction between them without words is extremely moving and I'd like to show it to you now.
Wow. No matter how many times I see that, it always really gets to me. So let's move on to the next uh, element of the wow effect. And uh, let's talk about immersive art. The current trend of art takes interactive art one step further to immersive art installations that actually transform us uh, to another realm and disconnect us from reality. Now, when you say immersive art installations, or when you say immersive art, you say Yayoi Kusama. This 92-year-old Japanese artist has been act active in the, art, in the field of art for 70 years, but only in the last decade has she burst into the public consciousness. In recent years, uh, a phenomenon known as the Kusama mania has developed. In every city, it re she, she exhibits a crazy race for tickets to, to the exhibitions begin. And uh, her exhibitions center on mirrored rooms, which are called infinity rooms, in which the visitor reflects in it endless uh, in endless uh, duplications, uh, like here. Uh, this is me in the current uh, exhibition showing at the Tel Aviv Museum. This exhibition has broken all ticket sales in Israel. Over 300,000 tickets have already been sold and it is the thing to do today in, in Tel Aviv. I must say that I too have uh, become addicted to the Kusama immersive experience and since the show, the first show I saw uh, in 2012 at Tate Modern, I've seen or experienced other shows in Lo London, Los Angeles, and as I said, in Tel Aviv. The sad uh, aspect of it is that as her popularity has grown, the time you can actually spend in one of these in, uh, infinity rooms uh, gets shorter. And now it's between 30 seconds and one minute. Uh, like here uh, in another um, infinity room in Tel Aviv. This contradicts the Kusama vision of, uh, of a meditative experience, which is what she had in mind when you enter the, these infinity rooms and you actually feel um, like you yourself are a small dot in the universe and, and you become one with the universe and all these ideas uh, that she has, but they all need time, and time is something that they don't give you in these museums because the lines are low, are long, and people are waiting to get in, and uh, you have to get in, get out, and next, let the let the next person in. So it's interesting to ask why why is it only now, after seven decades, that uh, Kusama has gained such a wild world world resonance, and the answer to that might be that her art is perfect for the Instagram era. So if you look up uh, uh, on Instagram, hashtag Kusama or has, uh, hashtag infinity, infinity rooms, <laughs> then you'll see so many uh, impressions. Sorry. Her exhibitions, they photograph great and the rush for tickets really creates a barrier between those lucky ticket holders and others that just couldn't get in. And you know, we are in the age of FOMO, which is fear of missing out. And the greater the buzz, the greater the, the FOMO. And that's why people are rushing to buy tickets to see her and be part of this uh, uh, experience that everyone is talking about. Another hit in the immersive realm are Team Lab. Team Lab uh, is a Japanese collective that combines artists designers and computer technicians, and they create 
amazing, immersive and spectacular installations. Um, they have been operating since 2001, but uh, only became popular in the Western world when the commercial gallery Pace um, began to represent them. And that's where I saw in London Pace, I saw one of their shows in 2017 for the first time. And I was lucky to be alone there because it was pre-opening or nearly alone. And the idea of an immersive installation uh, in a commercial gallery isn't something uh, self-evident, but uh, Pace Gallery really is a pioneer in this field. And they recently opened uh, an immersive space in Miami called Super Blue. So if you are around that area, maybe you've seen it. And if not, I'm sure it's amazing. So back to Team Lab, uh, the exhibition that I uh, saw had a number of installations and this was the most impressive room. And what you see is, is uh, um, a lookalike waterfall that is supposedly flowing from the wall opposite and coming towards uh, the end of the room. And you can see underwater flowers that change all the time. And the flowers also multiply on the walls when you stand next to them. And this is the guide who took me through. And uh, this is uh, an in, uh, innovative element in their uh, installations because they are not only immersive, but they are also interactive. And what you see here is the way the water parts. If you're standing uh, on the floor there, then the water as it comes towards you will part uh, on, on, on both, to both sides of you. And that's really special. If you touch the, the, the butterflies on the wall, they fall and supposedly die. So this is also how you can affect uh, uh, the, the, actually, the actual installation. And, and I'm sure you can understand the magic of this experience when, when you affect what's happening in the room. So um, it's not uh, by chance that uh, Team Lava becomes such a great attraction also wherever they exhibit. And a few years ago, they opened their own space in Tokyo, which is sometimes called the Disneyland of the art world. But I wish I could go to Tokyo and see it. The immersive trend combined with technology has led to an interesting phenomenon of dedicated spaces, such as the, this uh, Atelier de Lumière in Paris, where I visited um, in October 2019, saw the Van Gogh experience, which is a multi-sensory experience that combines movement and music, and the music adapts to the projected paintings. I um, must say that as, a, as an art professional or an art lover, it, it's more of a curiosity, but it does, um, it does prove an interesting entry point for children and for, for young people or even for adults that don't usually go to museums and are, are less familiar with classical artists, but here is like everybody now knows who Van Gogh is. And I was surprised to, to learn that in the past few years, uh, in the past year actually, there have been four different versions of the Van Gogh experience in the United States. They're all fully booked. Uh, and apparently, the popularity of this event stems from an episode of the Netflix series Emily in Paris that aired during the pandemic, in which uh, in one of the episodes, she visits with her friends the local uh, Van Gogh experience, which I uh, mentioned in Atelier de Lumière. And since then, it's become crazy. Everybody wants the, the Van Gogh experience. Now, here's another uh, immersive space that opened in New York. It's called Art Tech House. It's underneath the Chelsea Market. And the space was inaugurated by one of the pioneering artists of new media, uh, a Turkish uh, artist named Rafik Anadol, who now works in uh, Los Angeles. He uses data and artificial intelligence as his creative material. And um, what he did was he took uh, New York as his project, and he used big data to uh, collect all the images on the web that uh, show New York, and he created one of his uh, 
uh, immersive videos, uh, and I'll show you uh, a bit of it now. <laughs> like to see that as well. Uh, the charm of these immersive spaces actually uh, is all part of, of deta the, the detachment that they offer from reality. You go into one of these places and you are completely disconnected. You forget what's happening outside. And, and it doesn't matter if it's a reputed uh, artist like Rafik Anadol or a performance um, that was also shown at uh, Art Tech House, inspired by Pantone's Color of the Year. People flock in droves uh, for the immersive experience and the wow feeling that they um, uh, enable. So with all this new and exciting stimuli competing for our time and attention, an interesting question to, uh, to ask is how will traditional museums, how can they remain relevant when the stimulus threshold is constantly rising. So I'm not talking about uh, the audience that uh, uh, will, will look at, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the art loving uh, audience that is actually less enthusiastic about the pyrotechnics. I actually asked my Facebook uh, community about their wow experiences and the majority uh, uh, spoke about standing in front of a particularly uh, moving painting or sculpture and uh, the technology doesn't necessarily impress them. But in the age of experience, museums are required to maintain their relevance so that they can attract, uh, continue attracting audience and they need to make their experience more interactive and more enticing. Now, uh, you might remember signs like these uh, up till not long ago, till I think uh, 2016 maybe, it was still not permitted to take photos in, in some of the major museums. And this was already a problem in 2013 that was coined the year of the selfie where when um, the selfie uh, exploded I remember in my book that I wrote in 2014, I had, I had to explain what a selfie is, and that wasn't that long ago. So it's hard to grasp, but there were serious uh, um, struggles between, let's call them the conservatives and the advanced, and the conservatives didn't want their museums to become uh, what they called selfie centrals, but the advanced realized the advantage of sharing content and sharing museum experience in an age in which sharing is everything. And now we are exactly in, in the opposite situation when a museum like uh, uh, modern, uh, uh, the Museum of Fine Art, Fine Art in Boston can put up a sign like this, if you don't share a photo from this exhibition, did you really visit? So uh, see how the standard has changed and how museums have um, made such a transformation uh, in realizing what they need to do to, to remain relevant. Now, I visited the, the Modigliani exhibition in 2018, let's say not exactly a blockbuster show, but there was something re really new and special there. 
At the end of the museum, at the end of the exhibition, there was a virtual reality room. And um, luckily the line was short, so I waited. Now this technology itself pr provides a completely immersive experience that uh, disconnects you from the environment. And uh, uh, it wasn't my first, but it was certainly the best. And it allows you to be in two places at the same time. So on the one hand, I was sitting on a chair in the Tate Museum, and also I was visiting virtually Modigliani's studio in Paris in the early 20th century. And uh, I could hear the rain through the open window, and, um, and I could feel the atmosphere inside the studio. And then during the, the experience, I moved to three different, uh, to, to two other different uh, locations inside the studio. The last one, I was sitting on the chair by the table you can see in front of you. And, and if you can imagine, I was sitting facing where uh, the viewpoint that we can see in this slide. And I'm uh, sitting looking at the easel opposite me and there is a cigarette on the table in an ashtray and the cigarette is smoking. And on my right, is a mirror that you can see there by the window. And I look to my right and the chair that I'm sitting on is empty. And that really takes me back uh, to the realization that this is a virtual experience and it's not the reality, but it felt real, it really did. So virtual space is, um, is the future in many ways and it is infinite. And we are really only at the beginning of the road in terms of possibilities. Uh, and here I'd like to show you uh, an example of a virtual drawing tool called Tilt, which was developed by Google. And uh, let's see what they, the, their, their trailer and what can be done with it. That's the future, but before we conclude, here's some food for thought uh, for you. Uh, the, what we are experiencing now is a kind of democratization of culture in the sense of culture for all. Let's uh, give you interactive and immersive experience and it kind of flattens out art and measures cultural events in terms of popularity. Uh, because art has uh, many aspects of art have become entertainment and the main purpose being bringing in an audience and in 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 that in these circumstances we are in danger of losing the sensitivity to that quiet simple um, meditative experience of standing in front of a, a work of art and it it may sometimes just be like this drawing which was which is a one line drawing by by Picasso and the experience, the wow experience this can evoke is very internal and personal. So we have to keep in mind that even in today's age of experience and technology and AI and VI, VR and AR, uh, a simple line can still provide an uplifting uh, experience and it can uh, woo us and can comfort us and produce a wow effect. And the last uh, slide I want to uh, share with you um, is my happy place in Mitzperamon in the Negev Desert. And at the end of the day, maybe the biggest wow we can get is nature. Uh, if we just pay attention and every time I stand on the edge of the crater, 
um, as I did here when I took this photo and I look in front of me and all around me and I see no signs of civilization and I see the world just as God created it. And uh, my wow experience is, is way beyond words. So uh, this is the full scale, the full scope of the wow experience from being speechless to having uh, technological immersive experiences. And I hope I managed to capture this uh, uh, phenomenon and this uh, topic of the wow uh, effect. And uh, thank you for being with me. I'll just leave you with, uh, with this um, QR code uh, that if you scan it with your phone, it will lead you to my uh, mailing list uh, page. And I would love for you to join. And I will send you interesting information on the art art world and of course uh, information about any upcoming lectures so uh, please join me and thank you again uh, goodbye um, I'm curious just uh, for those of you that were able to see the video uh, that she just displayed maybe you could put some reactions into uh, the chat from seeing this form of interactive art. Deborah says, moving, powerful, love this webinar. Well, we love you back, Jan. Uh, Bonnie's crying. Uh, and, and we heard that there were a, a range of emotions uh, associated with just looking at someone directly beautiful and moving, highly emotive, uh, a range of emotions. And I think that's what we come to expect uh, with performance art, interactive art. The uh, question about how long uh, the interaction was, I think these were, were timed. So I think they tended to be short, but you can imagine someone doing this for seven hours is a real challenge. Intense moment, Wendy says. You know, I have a, 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 while we're waiting to see if we can get Debbie back here, um, I was very curious uh, by the provocative title uh, about the, the book uh, that uh, Debbie wrote in, in Hebrew, why Mona Lisa lost her smile and the explanation we got from Debbie was that people were turning their backs on her and essentially using our modern day camera of, uh, uh, for a, 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 a selfie with Mona Lisa. And then when we watched the, uh, the very next installation that we saw, uh, we saw an example from Daniel Rosen of people being able to project themselves into the very images that uh, were being uh, a scene. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, uh, Candida says, I think Mona Lisa would love our tech opportunities. Uh, uh, Candida, uh, some of you know, uh, 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 recently did an exhibit around the world that focused, focused on what, what's now now known as AR, augmented reality, when you can actually bring a image to a physical place, even outdoors and during uh, COVID, uh, like the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens and other uh, gardens in, in Sarasota, Florida and around the world that participated in this very unique uh, exhibition. So this idea that we can interact with art, art icons, uh, augmented reality images becomes a new way essentially of us being able to interact with art uh, certainly something very powerful. And, um, uh, and, and, and again, I, I haven't been, I, I see some people making reference to the Van Gogh exhibit as an interactive exhibit. We had tickets, had to give them away. Um, uh, and I am curious to, to hear from some people. It's been such a phenomenon. Uh, my friends uh, who have seen it have, have, have really you know, said it, it was a bit of a transformative kind of experiences, kind of experience, and is beginning uh, to expand our notion of how we can 
interact with art in ways where um, the digital and the actual and the audience can come together. Uh, there are examples where we can't come together physically, and there are some challenges we know in, during COVID that have made that uh, possibility uh, uh, need us to be adaptive. That's how this webinar series, many of you know, was actually born. It was born out of a problem, a challenge. We couldn't bring people to Israel to experience some of the wows that we do. Um, we have, I think, a negative uh, response that uh, to the Van Gogh exhibit um, and a positive response. Some people said experience was a lot of fun. Others said it didn't feel as authentic. Um, so I, uh, I, I think we're going. We're as we continue to adapt. I think we are going to see different reactions because, of, frankly, our expectations are so different about how. Uh, uh, we're able to, to act. Uh, grounds for sculpture in New Jersey uh, has an opportunity to integrate. There are some people referring to the Machu Picchu exhibit, which is actually here in South Florida right now. I don't know if it travels to other places as well. I don't know if anyone has seen it. I've got family that's going to see it uh, tomorrow, actually. Um, a question about whether technology encourages us to leave the real in favor of the unreal from, from Carol. Uh, so this is uh, one of the questions that I think that, that people are asking. The very first exhibit that uh, uh, artist that, that we, Debbie was featuring with Crystal, I remember seeing those wrapped islands as a kid uh, growing up in, in Miami Beach. And indeed, it sort of warped my sense of A, both what experiencing art was and thinking about experiencing nature. Some of the images and some of the uh, art installations that we know that Christo created in his lifetime, including the, uh, the very last one that we saw in the Art de Triomphe, required perspective to even see them. Um, and Indeed, I think that's the kind of um, uh, you know newness that uh, our technology is bringing uh, to bear, and that is rubbing some people, frankly, the wrong way, and and who are experiencing it for the first time. Others who are just blown away by it and feel like this is the new wow. Uh, I have a a, a a a a personal hunch that part of that wow is when we can physically congregate in safe ways. And I know the Van Gogh exhibit, even during uh, 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 COVID, had to make some adjustments and some uh, real-time art and theater work, had to ensure that there was social distancing between people. But nonetheless, there were people in a common space that uh, were going through a common experience, even if they had nothing common involved politically, religiously, ge geographically, they just happen to be in that same space. And I think that is one of the questions of this period that is being so forcefully put uh, to uh, art and experience in, uh, in, in our society, is how do we find experiences that allow people to overcome whatever their baggage or their differences when they're walking into that room, and then to come together, as Deborah says, it's a good way to bring diverse people together, and then have them walk out of that experience, maybe scratching their head, maybe saying, wow, maybe saying, hmm, didn't work for me, the entire range of experiences that we had, but that people of very, very different backgrounds are able to come to bed together and experience some of those things. So, Indeed, um, we promised to everyone uh, we will provide uh, a link uh, for uh, uh, everything that we've seen up until now and including uh, the potential for showing some material um, that, uh, uh, you know, Debbie uh, wants to show. We're going to try to connect her now, uh, apparently via cell phone and see if that will work. Uh, apparently something is wrong with the Zoom connection now with her. We also have a couple more videos in her segment uh, that are in front of us 
that I think we'll be able to uh, see once we try to connect her to see if we can bring her in via audio. And then uh, if you hang on there with us, we'll make sure to try to uh, go to our, our uh, um, uh, I, I, I can tell you one of the things that, that we're uh, uh, very practiced at now is having a plan B. And plan B always includes having the backup slides to be able to share with you in the event we have uh, challenges from uh, the, the weather or from the Zoom channel or for anything else. So hang in there. We're going to try to bring Debbie in uh, via um, uh, audio and as well. Um, uh, so I'm getting a little love about this idea of having a plan B. At the moment, I think we all uh, have learned that, that uh, a plan B is a good thing to have sometimes plan C as well. Uh, a comment here from Lisa while we're waiting about uh, excitement about seeing the K Katsuma exhibit in Tel Aviv next month. Maybe actually people could put into their uh, into the chat now some of their prospective uh, uh, experiences that you're looking forward to. We're in this sort of uh, uh, wait and see moment. I know many of us that had wanted to get on planes and visit Israel. Uh, we have not been able to do that, and uh, we're looking forward, hopefully, to some uh, possibilities about international travel resuming. Some of us are returning with our masks to indoor spaces that allow us to have social distant uh, experiences in art galleries. Some of us are still, uh, those of us that are lucky to be in warm weather climates are looking for alternative experiences outdoors. I had one on Halloween when some neighbors decided uh, to create a whodunit kind of mystery, uh, multi-generational, and uh, from their front lawn, do a, uh, a takeoff on Clue, for those of you that know Clue, and it was really a lot of fun, and it, 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 it was possible this year uh, in uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, where, where I experienced that for the first time uh, with uh, neighbors. But at the same time, we recognize now some people are just literally not able to get out of uh, their apartments and are looking for um, worthwhile and interesting things to do uh, either in front of the little screen or the multiple screens. We had a, a, a suggestion to see Forever D. Young on a big screen. The Met Cloisters. All great, um, Le, Or Le Oranger Museum in Paris, seeing the eight Monet water lilies was an ex uh, a, a powerful experience, writes Rhonda. There's a, a reference to the Marshal du Ducamp uh, adding of a mustache to the Mona Lisa and whether, uh, one thinks that's in, in good spirit and uh, taste. Uh, certainly, we have the ability now with our many gadgets to interact with art icons. Not sure how uh, uh, the original artists would uh, relate to that, but it certainly shows a resilience to art in the way that new technologies uh, allow for us to, to, to try some new things. And that's certainly one of the things that we're experiencing uh, during this period, art and artists are uh, stuck in their caves, some of them, um, but that hasn't necessarily stopped everyone from creating. And we've seen some interesting examples of, of people trying to do it. Um, okay, so um, I have a, a note from um, uh, our production team, our, our wizards behind the scenes, who are gonna bring up one of the next videos in uh, Candida, in, in, in the presentation that we had from Debbie. And so uh, we'll go ahead and try that and uh, give you another example from her presentation, abridged here a little bit of a wow moment. Okay, so let's try to uh, uh, see if, if uh, that will work. I'm being told one more moment, things moving a little bit slower than usual today. I've got a reference from Anna to the Fluxus movement with the happenings in the early 1970s. That's an art reference I'm not familiar with, but thanks for sharing that, Anna. 
I'm being told I could have a second career as a QVC host or on a telethon, which I think is uh, um, a, a, an expression of, um, you know, when you need to, to uh, um, uh, find a little extra time, uh, it's easier when you're doing it in real time. Because I feel like I have this audience with my back. I feel like we've all had each other's back over this past uh, couple of years. Uh, so here we go. Uh, we're going to take another look at um, uh, some of the slide work from Debbie that, that got interrupted uh, uh, during her presentation. Uh, we're almost there. We're, we're uh, uh, going to, uh, we'll, tr we'll try again. Look, here we go. Let's see if this, this will work. We're at least seeing some of the images of, of one of uh, the exhibits that, that uh, uh, Debbie had intended. And I know that a, a little bit further into this series, I think she's got another uh, video segment that we can show. This is Kusama. I think on a day like today, being indoors um, may be one of the uh, few options we have. Here's the Van Gogh. Um, and I know we have some people who have seen it and uh, commented on it. One of the things that's interesting about this is just seeing the, the, the different people sitting on the floor, standing, standing in groups, standing uh, as, as a family or coming together. Here we go. One of the, the videos that, uh, for those of you that haven't been at one of these interactive uh, places before, at least gives you a feel for it. I see that we, um, we're, we're, we're still trying to get Debbie back on and hopefully we'll be able to uh, shortly. Uh, I think she is in the chat at the moment and we'll be able to give you a little bit, hopefully, of uh, before we uh, close out at the top of the hour, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get her back on. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat uh, 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 additional references, the multi-story Blue Bear in downtown Denver. That's where one of my daughters is at the moment. So I will pass on that recommendation to, uh, to her. And I think uh, using today as a bit of a crowdsource for everybody to share these incredible experiences. There are some people uh, uh, I think who've seen the Kusama in, um, in Canada. Uh, and 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 now at the uh, Tel Aviv Museum of Art that have really spoken highly. The Design Museum of Cologne, Israel has uh, interesting interactive exhibits. Michal said, for those of you in Israel or those of you starting to uh, uh, put together your, your top 10 list for your next. Mia Wolf in Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
Uh, Kusama was at the Hirshhorn in DC, Ruthie points out, uh, something I missed. James Terrell exhibits. James um, uh, uh, Terrell exhibited, um, we have a shout out for seeing the invisible Candida uh, uh, put in the chat and gets a yes to that. So there's a lot out there now. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, we hope that this at least whets your appetite uh, to try it if you haven't and to maybe look for some of these experiences as they come around. Uh, PS1 James Terrell Room, open to the sky, Robin shares. Tashima Art Museum, Barbara shares. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I see Debbie back with us. Uh, and we held our breaths long enough. And thanks for staying with us. We at least got to see some of the additional slides. Let's see. No, not quite yet. Um, all right, so why don't we, um, uh, we'll continue to pick up with the slides where we left off. And if we can, bring up that slide deck. We'll play a few more while we're still seeing if we can get Debbie on maybe by audio to share a few comments and- Can you hear me? Oh, Debbie, we can hear you. Oh, so wow. you, I'm so sorry. That's okay. We've continued and we're getting some great reactions from people uh, who believe in adaptability. That's because they understand in Israel, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't stop. You just keep going, and uh, uh, you have a plan. You've been amazing. You've been amazing. I plan B and plan C. So tell us a little about. We saw the second video um, in the slides, and we have a few more minutes. We should be able to get to the last one. Can you just tell us a little bit about what everybody saw in the second video? Well, the second video was. Um, uh, I was I, I was gonna I wanted to tell you about all these immersive uh, spaces that have popped up everywhere. Uh, the Van Gogh experience, and then this uh, uh, immersive space called Art Tech House in New York underneath the Chelsea Market. And um, there, uh, what, what, uh, what I showed you was the Rafik Anadol, who is a, um, um, a Turkish uh, artist based in LA, and he uh, uses um, artificial intelligence and big data to create his art. So he created this uh, immersive experience about New York City. And, um, and it was, he collected all the photos taken on the web uh, in New York City and created this amazing um, um, video, this kind of immersive experience that surrounds you. And, uh, and that was a, a bit of what, what you saw. So how far did you get? Okay, so um, I believe we're, we're, Debbie, I think that the safest course of action now is for us to run the slides and uh, just allow you to narrate over that. Fine. Fine. So Fine. we're, we're going to start, uh, 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 put the, we're going to put the slides up from our side as quickly as we can, and you can just sort of give us a little bit of, of, of narration. We'll have to go through it quickly, but I'll just give the audience a heads up that we'll plan on going over today. Uh, we, we usually finish right at the hour, but uh, we wanna make sure to at least have time to finish out the last several slides with, with Debbie and tell you about what we have coming up for you next week. So go ahead, Debbie. Okay, so uh, uh, let me see where you are. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so uh, with all this, uh, with all this, uh, um, pyrotechnics and, and everything, how does, how does, uh, how do museums remain relevant? Because people want uh, all these uh, flashy presentations and, and, and to be, uh, to be participants and museums, you know, they're, they're old school. A few years ago, you couldn't even take pictures in museums. Uh, many of you may, may remember, and it does seem uh, quite amazing. I think you can move on with the slide. Um, 
so so this uh, we we don't remember. This was 2013, and there were people that were saying, "No, no, we don't want our museums to become selfie central." And others others were saying, "If you have to enable people to to take photographs." Next slide. And um, so now you see things like this. If you don't share a photo from this exhibition, did you really visit? Because sharing is has become a, a, a big part of, um, of actually seeing an exhibition. And let's move on. So uh, museums have to be really um, creative. And this, uh, museum, this exhibition that I saw in 2018 in London at Tate Modern, Modigliani, it's not some blockbuster exhibition, but they did have something very um, special. Um, and what they had was a virtual reality room. Can we see the next slide, please? And uh, luckily the, the, the queue wasn't, wasn't very long in this, uh, uh, for this room and I went in and it was the most amazing, amazing thing. Next slide because the virtual reality enables us to be in two places at the same time. I hear am I sitting in the Tate Modern, but using, using my, my um, virtual reality headset, I am transported to uh, Modigliani's studio in Paris at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And I can hear the rain through coming, uh, coming down out from the open window and I can, see uh, and I feel as if I'm in the studio and this was the most amazing uh, experience because um, within the virtual reality experience I moved three times and the third place in the studio as you can see in this picture you can see an easel from the back and a chair with a table so the third position was um, as if you're sitting in front of the table and on your right is a mirror, and on the table is a is a cigarette is a, an ashtray, and there's a cigarette smoking. But then, when I look to the right in the mirror, the chair was empty. So that sort of brought me back and 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 made me uh, aware of the fact that I am only imagining this. This is virtual; it's not real, and then not, and I'm not really sitting on this chair. And then, of course, you come back to the room. And, and this is the future. This is what uh, we're going to see more and more. This is a, a, separate, um, uh, a separate lecture, but um, uh, this is part of, the, of the, the, the world of tomorrow. Next slide. Yeah, and um, talking about virtual, and we're, we're really at the end here. Um, I'd like you to see this uh, new tool by Google, which is called Google Tilt, and it shows you what can be done. Quite amazing. And uh, sometimes because of all this uh, technology, one can forget that a wow experience um, regarding art experiences can be from a very simple drawing, like this drawing by Picasso, which is one line. And uh, when I asked uh, people from my community, my Facebook community about wow experiences, then they talked about very intimate experiences in front of artworks that they love, paintings, drawings, sculptures. And um, uh, this is what art can bring to our lives. This uh, uh, uplifting um, experience of just um, um, being, being standing in front of a, of a, a brilliant artwork. 
Um, next slide. And of course, maybe the, the biggest thrill of all, uh, this is my favorite place, Mitzpah Ramon in Israel, in the Negev, where I try to spend as much time as I can. And I'm, I stand there on this exact point where I took the, the photo, and I see no signs of, of um, any, any, any people or any um, signs of, of civilization. It's just like, the, it's the world as God created it. And it moves me in ways that no technology can move me. Uh, so uh, that also can be the ultimate wow experience. So um, uh, that is uh, the end of my presentation. Just uh, there's one more slide uh, that you can scan and uh, it takes you to my website where you can register and see, uh, to, to future um, to hear future lectures uh, if you're interested. And um, I'm really sorry that my uh, Wi-Fi, my, my um, uh, connection cut out. Wayne, you did an amazing job holding it together. We're, 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 all, we're all about the wow and Kadima. We just keep moving forward. We have wow. got no time really? to sit back this, and- This uh, wild me, this wild me to see how you <laughs> held, the, held the thought and, well, thanks uh, for giving. Now, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer. Great. I, I, I don't think we'll be able to get any additional questions. We we have so many positive reactions uh, from, from everyone that's been here. We have questions now coming in about the, 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 the Google uh, uh, tilt. Yeah. People want to know how to use it. Um, that you might have to Google. I'm sure they've got plenty of uh, uh, information out. It, it, is it a tool that's already available now, or or they're just yes, sort of introducing yes. it? Yes, If you you Google uh, Google uh, <laughs> Google Tilt, and then you'll find everything. And 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 for those of you that don't have uh, you know the the latest technology, there's also you know the stuff we've been using since the Middle Ages. Yeah. Uh, paintbrushes. Uh, you can get them at the dollar store, you know, for uh, a dollar. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. And uh, uh, we don't care. We just want you to um, think of this time as an opportunity in whatever ways to uh, connect with other people. We found that's important. And art is one of those um, is the medium that allows us uh, to think more about uh, the possibility instead of what's not 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 possible. Technology has changed that, and it's allowed us to adapt even as we speak uh, to be able to interact with one and one another and be part of a community and, and be part of other creators and creative work. And sometimes that's looking at the creations of the world, which is why I was so glad Debbie, uh, uh, you know, ended that uh, tech savvy uh, uh, tour. Uh, with something that was really some, something that we unfortunately don't want to take for granted uh, these days, the ability to see Mitzpah Ramon, the ability to see natural creation. And um, our best way of doing that, uh, that'll be a good segue to our next week's show. Next week, we're going to Beit Shan, uh, Beit Alpha. We're going to see a tell 25 civilizations on top of each other. Talk about a wow. Uh, when I first got that concept from James M Mishner, it did not mean anything to me until I actually experienced it in Israel. So we know, for those of you that, that uh, uh, can't join Reuben Solomon uh, in person, you can do it on our tour next Sunday. We hope all of you will join with us. We want to thank Debbie for being with us today. She's got a newsletter on art. You can follow her. You can scan her. You can learn about more and go in depth. If you read Hebrew, you can find out the full um, uh, uh, gestalt about why Mona Lisa lost her smile in, in Hebrew. Thanks for being um, with us. Somebody wants to bring me back for another webinar. Thank you, Dina. Okay, thanks to everybody that joined with us, stuck with us through uh, thick and through thin and through good weather and bad weather. Here we are on uh, Sunday. Shavua Tov to everyone. Be safe, be creative and think about well, new you. possibilities you. you didn't know about before. Thank you very much.